Okay. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, the uh, poll results are still up. So are they? E each person has to close the window. Oh, okay. Did you hear that, everyone? <laughs> you have to close your own window. Because I, I closed it here. But, uh, Okay, so I'll uh, introduce our speaker tonight, Will Dugood. He's a PhD candidate in fisheries ecology and marine conservation group at UVic. And he's working under Dr. Francis Juanez. So um, I'll uh, hand it over to Will and uh, take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Phil. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. Terrific. Okay, thank you very much for for the invitation to participate, um, and and thanks everyone for logging in as well. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, tonight about some work uh, in the Juanes lab at UVic, and so some of this is uh, is my dissertation work, uh, and then some of it is, is some other projects that we have running the lab and that we're just starting up. So uh, I'd like to whoop, maybe that. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the fact that uh, this work uh, is is a collaborative enterprise between many people, um, lots of uh, graduate students, research assistants, and volunteers in, in the biology department at UVic have contributed to this. Uh, I'd also like to thank my supervisor, uh, Francis Juanes, who is uh, tolerant of um, all kinds of uh, speculative ideas and uh, and lets uh, lets the folks in his lab run with them to see where they go, which is something I'm very appreciative of. Most of this work has been funded by the Pacific Salmon Foundation primarily, um, and also by MITACS and NSERC. And then there's a number of other organizations um, and granting agencies that have provided support as well, which are uh, which are listed down there at the bottom. So I'm going to talk tonight. Um, primarily about Chinook salmon. So uh, a bit of review, this is a pretty um, high profile species in BC, so most people are pretty familiar with them. But uh, they are the largest species of Pacific salmon, and they exhibit quite a lot of variation in uh, life history and marine migrations, both between and within populations. So there's uh, two primary life history types of Chinook salmon. There's stream type, which rear for a full year in fresh water before going to sea, and ocean type, which migrate uh, in the summer, the first summer after they hatch, uh, either a few weeks um, after emerging from the gravel or, or a few months after emerging from the gravel. So these ocean type Chinook are, are the fish I'm going to talk about primarily tonight. Uh, and Chinook return to fresh water after on average, uh, two to four years um, in the ocean. And uh, different stocks um, undergo different marine migrations, some very distant marine migrations and some remaining closer to their natal rivers and some a combination of the two. Uh, so obviously this is a species with very, very high cultural, uh, economic and ecological value in BC. So the economic value um, is both in fisheries and also in tourism. Uh, Chinook salmon supported and continue to support uh, a very valuable uh, recreational fishery in British Columbia. They also historically supported a very, very important um, commercial fishery, uh, although uh, that, that is considerably reduced compared to historical times. This photograph is from the 1980s in Active Pass, and so that's certainly not a scene that you see there anymore. Uh, Chinook salmon are also extremely important ecologically. Like other Pacific salmon, um, they contribute to uh, freshwater and uh, riparian habitats by nutrient import when they return from the ocean. But uh, probably their highest ecological profile is through their role as food for southern resident killer whales. So this is just a figure from a paper by Ford and others um, illustrating the uh, correlation between mortality anomalies of northern and southern resident killer whales and abundance anomalies of Chinook salmon. So basically you had a higher mortality of the resident whales during years where, uh, where Chinook salmon were less abundant. And Chinook salmon also have an important ecological role uh, 
as well for the trophic levels below them because they're at times the dominant uh, pelagic marine predator in coastal systems as well. And importantly uh, as well, Chinook salmon have very, very high cultural value. So this is a the image on the left is the um, harvest uh, fence on the Cowichan River early in the 20th century, shortly before uh, fences of this type were banned by, um, by the government as a management and harvest tool. And on the lower right is uh, the um, modern incarnation of that fence, which was implemented in the Cowich River for several years, starting in 2008, both uh, as a management tool and also to, uh, to um, provide education to youth in the community about the historical uses of, of fish weirs. So the importance uh, of Chinook to First Nations extends back thousands of years. And like many other Pacific salmon species, in British Columbia, Chinook salmon have experienced a decline. And you could show this in a lot of ways. You could show escapement, uh, the number of fish returning to the river. This particular figure is for aggregate Chinook salmon catch in British Columbia um, from 1970 to 2015. Uh, this is from um, the recent Ocean Ecology of Pacific Salmon book edited by Brian Riddell. So there has been a dramatic decline in, in Chinook salmon. And I think we can all agree on that. And so what caused this decline and the decline of Chinook and the decline of Pacific salmon in general, uh, the thinking in the 1990s or up until the 1990s can sort of be summed up by this quote from Nelson et al. But um, basically we attributed these declines to things that we could see. So uh, the blockage of rivers by dams, um, such as Bonneville and the Columbia there, the urbanization uh, and uh, agricultural use of rivers uh, the good Duwamish River estuary in the bottom right, and then obviously um, over extraction through either commercial or recreational fishing. So that's the, the iconic picture of um, BC Packers 45 at Ripple Point, which was on the $5 bill. So these obvious kind of tractable problems were really what were blamed for declines in Pacific salmon. However, um, over the last 20 years, or, or even um, at, at the, uh, in the last decade of the 20th century, it became obvious that something else was really important as well. So over the last four decades, hundreds of millions of coated wire tags have been implanted in the noses of both hatchery and wild Chinook and coho salmon. So these are tiny little alphanumeric tags that are embedded in the cartilage of the nose. And by um, estimating the number of tagged fish harvested in fisheries from, from the return of those fish, which are indicated as being tagged by having an adipose fin clip, um, and the number of tagged fish returning to rivers, you can actually estimate uh, the survival of those juveniles to return. And those marine survivals have declined precipitously. And particularly for Chinook, this decline is coastwide. And David Welsh has recently published a paper on this, indicating that it's not just in um, heavily impacted systems, but it's also in pristine systems in Southeast Alaska and Northern BC. Uh, where Chinook salmon uh, marine survivals are also declining. So it's become very clear that the ocean is very important. So for the last 20 years, the, um, the focus on explaining uh, declining marine survival of Pacific salmon in general, and Chinook salmon in particular, has really been on the ocean. And the challenge of that is that the ocean is a bit of a black box. Once fish move away from estuaries and rivers, they become much harder to study. So in estuarine habitats and in river habitats, we can actually get right up close with the fish, see the fish, uh, see what they're doing. Um, the pictures on the left are from work um, by, by Leah Shalifer and others in the, uh, in the Fraser River estuary, looking at habitat associations, growth and residency uh, of juvenile salmon there. The pictures on the right are of the BC Conservation Foundation doing snorkel swims in the Cowichan River, where they're actually looking at distribution and habitat associations of juvenile salmon. So this sort of work where, where you can actually perceive what the salmon are doing is challenging once the fish are, are in the ocean and have moved away from shore. So in the ocean, the primary tool for, uh, for studying juvenile Pacific salmon is midwater trawling. So this is the CCGS Sir John Frank, Franklin, the new research trawler. So midwater trawling uh, is hugely valuable. It samples the entire pelagic community and it has provided all sorts of important insights into the ocean ecology uh, of Pacific salmon. However, um, it is spatially and temporally coarse scale. 
And uh, what I mean by this is that the vessels are very expensive. Um, they have other uses that are required of them. So typically they may go out in a region uh, once a year or twice a year to do a survey, which gives you a temporal snapshot. And they, they tow a net over quite a long physical distance. Uh, it's, it's typically several kilometers that they tow a net, which limits their ability to, to provide insights into the fine scale structure of, of how juvenile salmon are using their habitat. Also, it's extremely expensive. Uh, I, I believe the Franklin is about $30,000 a day. Um, so this really limits participation in the marine ecology uh, research on Pacific salmon to state agencies, such as DFO and NOAA in the States. So what I wanna talk about in tonight's talk is some, some novel approaches to studying the marine ecology of juvenile Chinook salmon that we've developed in the lab um, with partners. And uh, specifically, um, two projects involving small vessel sampling, um, coupled with some, some electronic tagging. Uh, my dissertation research, which focused on patterns of fine scale habitat use by juvenile Chinook in the Southern Gulf Islands. And some work that we're currently developing in our, in our first year of right now, which is investigating the overwinter ecology of juvenile Chinook in the Strait of Georgia. And then another program, which is sort of a citizen science initiative where we're working with the public fishery in British Columbia to sample the, the diets of adult um, Chinook and coho salmon that have been harvested. So first I wanna talk about my dissertation research. So this was really centered around this question of whether diet distribution and growth of juvenile Chinook salmon varies at scales finer than would be typically considered in studies of the ocean ecology of juvenile salmon. If so, why, what, what factors underlie that variation and what implications might be for survival? So the approach we developed to do this was, was micro trolling, which is basically employing a small vessel with um, recreational downriggers fishing up to 12 lines simultaneously in a depth stratified way to sample juvenile fish. Now it has the advantage that it's cheap, it's flexible, you get depth stratified catch punit effort. It's non-lethal, which is, is good for tagging studies. It's quite difficult to catch fish non-lethally by trolling, which can be a problem if you want to tag them where you need them alive, but it can also be a problem if they're a protected stock, uh, you know, if they've got Sarah or, or other protection and, and you can't kill them, you need a way to sample them non-lethally. Non and this method also has uh, has negligible bycatch. So it's it's quite gratifying actually, you know, this, this approach has been picked up and is actually being used quite widely um, in Puget Sound and now also by a collaboration of First Nation groups and, and DFO on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So my, my dissertation research program was focused on the Southern Gulf Islands of the Salish Sea um, from 2015 to 2017. And it was linked to a larger study. And this larger study was a study applying pit tags to Cowich and River Chinook salmon to look at their survival. So this is gonna be a recurring theme in the talk where, where my ecology work is kind of piggybacking on a larger study aimed at measuring survival. And so I just want to diverge just for a second and explain that pit tagging study. So this was a project that was led by the BC Conservation Foundation and now DFO, particularly Kevin Pellet and Jameson Atkinson. And the idea was to try to understand where um, critical mortality periods occurred um, during the juvenile life history of Cowich and Chinook salmon. So fish were tagged with these passive integrative transponder tags, which is basically like the chip in your credit card. It has no battery and an indefinite life at different stages. They were tagged in the river before they migrated out. They were tagged by beach seine in Cowichan Bay soon after entering the ocean. They were tagged further out in the bay by purse saners once they moved into the, the pelagic environment still within Cowichan Bay. And then we contributed to tagging them further afield in the Southern Gulf Islands with hook and line in the autumn of their first year at sea. Uh, and then within the Cowichan River, there's arrays of pit tag receivers. And these pit tag receivers pictured there at the bottom actually detect the pit tags when the adult fish return, giving you a, an individual uh, read on whether that fish survived to adulthood. And you can actually, if you visit the Cowichan counting fence that's uh, operated by Cowichan, first, or Cowichan tribes, you can actually see the uh, pit tag array um, immediately downstream of the fence. So I just wanna show what this looks like. I've got a silly little video. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick switch if I can. Uh, this is a video, it was actually taken in my own boat. Um, I don't know if, hopefully you can see that. Interrupt me if you can't. So 
we use a bigger boat for this now. Um, this was was when we were just piloting the project, but it shows that this approach can be used in a, even a really small boat. So here I am, I lift in a little juvenile Chinook into a, a live well, which in that case is just a cooler. And these are depth stratified deployments. So I know how deep each hook is, um, either a zero or a one, depending whether I catch fish. So fish are landed alive. Um, we then wand them for a pit tag. So that's a pit tag wand, test whether the fish uh, had already received a pit tag. The fish is lightly anesthetized. Uh, the metal detector to check whether this juvenile Chinook does or doesn't have a coded wire tag from one of the coded wire tagging programs. Um, measured for fork length, obviously. Um, then uh, to sample diets, we use gastric lavage. So we non-lethally sample the diet. So this is just a squirt bottle flushing out the stomach contents. and then apply a pit tag. So the pit tag is actually injected. Um, the fish goes back into the live well. It would then be sampled for scales and the scales are used both for retrospective growth analysis and then also for GSI, for determining genetic stock, which river that fish is from. And then after the fish recovers from the anesthetic, um, it's released to continue on its way and then hopefully um, come back a few years later. So I'll just stop that. if I can make this work. All right. So uh, in, we started this in 2015 at five sites in the Southern Gulf Islands. Um, and I'm not, I don't have time tonight to talk about this, this first year, but suffice to say, we, we uh, examined um, the diet size and growth of juvenile ocean type Chinook at these sites. We found some interesting patterns uh, and it led to a more focused uh, case study in 2016 and 2017, focusing on just two of these sites. So I'm going to limit um, my explanation tonight to that. So these sites, a lot of folks are probably familiar with them. This is Couch and, or uh, sorry, um, Sansom Narrows and Maple Bay. So the, the two sampling areas are indicated in the bottom left there with the green and yellow color. And just to give a sense of uh, how this sampling program compares to a traditional uh, midwater trawl program, the red line on the lower left gives you a sense of the length of a typical midwater trawl set. So all of the variability that I'm going to discuss here in the subsequent slides would be basically uh, integrated in a single set, a single dump of the net in a trawling program. So I'm asking, is there variation in what the fish are doing at a scale finer than you, you would resolve with a trawling program? These sort of sites are also challenging places to trawl, uh, just based on their, topo their topography as well. So about three kilometers between the two sites, uh, Sansom Narrows, there's a tidal jet where the flood tide flows through from satellite channel. Uh, and this is basically the interface between satellite channel and Stewart channel. And to give you a sense, uh, the swim time between these sites for a fish of the size that we're dealing with would be give or take about three and a half hours at an average swimming speed. So really quite close to each other. So between uh, 2015 and, and 2016, we found consistent differences in the diet of fish at these two sites. So we had a higher frequency of empty stomachs and uh, also a, a higher occurrence of fish with herring in their diets at Sansom Narrows than at Maple Bay, with that different being consistent across years. And these are all small age zero herring. This is now a plot of fork length by date in 2015 on the top, 2016 on the bottom, Maple Bay in green, Sansom Narrows in yellow. So there was also a consistent difference in size. So fish at Sansa Narrows were larger than those at Maple Bay. And then this is now a, a reconstruction of the growth rate. So the growth rate uh, proxy I'm using here is how wide the rings are on the scale. So fish lay down wider rings on their scales when they're growing more rapidly. So how quickly the fish were growing uh, at different sizes, basically, during their lives. And this is for Cowichan River origin Chinook salmon identified by genetics that are either um, hatchery on the top or wild on the bottom. And so the take home here is that uh, fish at these sites were or fish at Sansom Narrows were growing faster than those at Maple Bay. So even at these two very, very closely adjacent sites, we have uh, one site where, where fish are bigger, faster growing and have more herring in their diets than the other. And we wanted to know were there actually more herring at Sansom Narrows to explain this. So we did some um, acoustic, active acoustic transects. So this is using uh, basically sonar. It's an instrument called the uh, Acoustic Zooplankton Fish Profiler that was lent to us by, um, by ASL Environmental Sciences. 
So we did some transects at these sites and, uh, and sure enough, this is just an example. We did, we did uh, more complex modeling than this, but this is an example of four transects at these sites uh, or at Maple Bay um, on a single day in September. And fish aggregations, so schools, which we, we think are primarily uh, juvenile herring are in red. And uh, by comparison at Maple or at Sansom Narrows, you can see far more, um, far more aggregations of fish. So it was pretty compelling that there were more, uh, more schools of fish, which we were suspecting are, are age zero herring at Sansom Narrows than at Maple Bay. So we've got fish that are different at these two sites, possibly because they're eating herring at Sansom Narrows. Um, but we wanted to know, you know, what are the fish actually doing? All right, are they just sitting? You know, it seems implausible that they're just uh, have high sight fidelity and don't move around given the juvenile salmon are, are highly mobile animals. So we had an opportunity in 2017 to work with Contamer uh, Research Services to, uh, to apply acoustic tags to fish. Now, again, the, the primary goal of this was to measure survival, not to, um, to study fine scale ecology, but, uh, but I was able to, to ask that half of these fish be released at Maple Bay and half of these fish be released at Sansom Narrows. So these are the two study sites. And these acoustic tags are larger than pit tags. They do have a battery and they actually ping. And each fish has a unique ping. So they could be detected, these tags could be detected up to about 70, 750 meters. And we used a combination of passive receivers that could detect the tags. So those are the black dots in the map to the bottom right. And then also stations where we would go with a boat and listen for the tags. So those are the open uh, colored symbols in this image. And so we did some intense surveys in the 10 days after tagging, where we would go to 60 stations a day with the boat and listen for these tags to look at what the fish were doing. And so what did we see? Um, these uh, animations, the, the Contama website has these animations and you can actually go there, it's, it's publicly available and you can play with them yourself. It's quite fun, not just for this project, but for some other projects as well. So I'm just gonna share, hopefully, um, my browser. Okay, hopefully you can see that. So this is now the map, the yellow dots or the orange dots are the receivers. And I'm just going to play this. You see the time will play on the top right. And these are the tags. So those are the tags in blue released at Maple Bay and in red released at Sansom Narrows. Uh, and you can see them moving around the area, some of them leaving. Uh, and it's a pretty chaotic, uh, pretty chaotic scene, right? It's hard to tell uh, whether Maple Bay fish and, and Sansom Narrows fish are doing something different or not but they are. Uh, and if we narrow it down, I've just picked two uh, sample fish here. So one fish um, tagged at Maple Bay in blue there, one fish tagged at Sansom Narrows in red. And you can see, you can see us, the little boat, uh, cruising around there detecting the tags um, in the first few days after tagging. And you can see these fish moving around being repeatedly detected on these receivers. And so these two fish were both fish that survived in the study area until at least January. And if I fast forward this now uh, to the end, you'll see their tracks and where they went. So the, you can see the fish tagged at Sansom Narrows in red, um, never went further north than Grave Point, never passed Crofton. Uh, and the fish uh, tagged at Maple Bay in blue actually never went through Sansom Narrows, never made it to Sansom Narrows in that entire period of time. By comparison, the fish tagged at Sansom Narrows was detected there on 61 separate days over four months and in a total of 423 separate hours. So we've got some, some individual fish doing some very interesting uh, different things there. So I'm just gonna stop that, go back here. So if we look at that by, uh, by actually um, depicting where on average uh, fit or, or, or the, the um, probability of frequency of detecting a fish tagged at those two sites, again, the tagging sites are in red on the left, that's the distribution basically of fish tagged at Sansom Narrows. On the right is the distribution of fish tagged in Maple Bay. And you can see that fish uh, tagged in Sansom Narrows were more likely to be detected north and south of Sansom Narrows. Fish tagged in Maple Bay more likely to be detected north and south of Maple Bay. So quite different distributional patterns. And then if you overlay uh, seal observations onto that, uh, the black seal silhouettes are the locations of haulouts. Uh, the red bubbles are, are actual counts of seals during our mobile tracking. You can infer that potentially for the, the fish tag that sends and narrows, that behavior of passing repeatedly through the narrows, possibly due to co-location with age zero Pacific herring, potentially could also expose them to higher predation risk. 
So some conclusions from this, this fine scale habitat use work is basically that there is meaningful, very fine scale structure in habitat use with different fish doing different things at fine scales. And also that this fine scale structure very likely has implications for survival. And I think importantly, juvenile herring may be very important for structuring the distribution of juvenile, uh, juvenile Chinook salmon. And uh, I just wanna talk about that for a second and go on a little digression about the importance of age zero herring. So in our work, we found that herring were the, the most important single diet item. So those are the bars here. Uh, they were 25% of the diet overall, but only 8.4% of juvenile Chinook actually contained herring. And those fish that did contain herring had greater stomach fullness than those which didn't. And we know from, from a broad literature with salmon and other species that piscivory, so consuming fish prey, is strongly linked to growth. So eating herring is probably very good for survival. This figure basically shows whether things, whether diet items were occurring together in Chinook diets more often in green or less often in red than expected by chance. And um, what I wanted to take away from this is that herring was really a standout in that it occurred less often than you'd expect by chance with a majority of, uh, of other prey items. So the implication here is that once fish have, have switched to feeding on juvenile Pacific herring, they appear to actually be specializing on, on those fish. And when you take a look at a typical um, herring that's been consumed by a juvenile Chinook, they're very large with respect to the juvenile Chinook. So here's, here's a typical example, uh, and quite close to the size threshold, the maximum size threshold that you'd expect these juvenile Chinook to be able to consume. And again, if you plot, this is similar to what I showed you before. This is the fork length by date of fish that either have consumed Pacific herring in green, um, have empty stomachs in red, or have consumed other prey in blue. So the takeaway here is that fish that are eating Pacific herring are larger, and perhaps it's actually only the largest individuals in the population that are able to consume the age zero herring that are available to them. And I think this is quite an important point. And one of the questions is, could this explain some of the changes in survival of juvenile Chinook over time? So we have seen changes in the population diversity of Pacific herring in the Salish Sea, specifically Cherry Point herring, which were formerly the largest stock in the inland waters of Washington state. Uh, have almost completely disappeared. And this is a late spawning stock. They spawned in April. And so one would expect them to have produced smaller age zero herring, uh, which potentially would have been more important through the summer to juvenile Chinook. We also know that the size of age zero herring is larger when the spring temperatures are warm. So with climate change and the warming of the Strait of Georgia, we may be producing larger juvenile herring, which may be less accessible to juvenile Chinook. And then growth is also density dependent. So when juvenile uh, age zero herring are abundant, they're smaller. And when they're less abundant, they're larger. So it could be that, that either regional or local uh, decreases in the abundance of age zero herring could also be reducing their size or increasing their size, sorry, and making them less available to, to juvenile salmon. So there I wanna leave the, the fine scale ecology stuff and move on to the next bit of this talk, which is um, winter. So. I introduced the pit tagging study that, uh, that our study was a small part of. And, and here are some results of that pit tagging study. So these are the return to the river um, proportions of fish tagged in the river, fish tagged using beach seines, fish tagged using purse seines, and, and fish that were part of this work that I, I just described to you tagged by micro trolling. So you can see as you would expect, uh, as you move later in the first summer, the proportion of those fish that are returning is higher. Interestingly, the proportion of wild fish that return is much higher than hatchery, even after they've spent uh, the whole of their first summer in the ocean, which is really fascinating. But I think it's important to note here that at least 95% mortality, even for wild fish, happens after the first summer at sea. And that there's differential mortality of wild and hatchery fish after the first September. So the question here is when and how is this mortality occurring? So this is a sort of a conceptual cartoon of the abundance of a, a, a hypothetical cohort of juvenile Chinook salmon through time. And this is a, a pattern that is hypothetically um, been outlined by Beamish and others as the critical period hypothesis. And so the idea is that there's very, very high um, mortality soon after ocean entry that's related to predation when, when abundance declines rapidly. There's then a period of, of stable or slowly decreasing abundance through the first summer. And then during the first marine winter, there's another critical period um, where starvation 
uh, possibly of fish that grew poorly early in the summer and, and didn't store adequate lipid reserves leads to high mortality during the first winter. So this is a very popular hypothesis and it drives a lot of the research. I mean, our work looking at growth in the first summer is partially driven by this supposition that, that it's very important because otherwise fish starve to death in the first winter. But we have very little information on what actually happens to these fish during the first winter at sea. So a recognition of the lack of knowledge of the winter ecology of juvenile Pacific salmon is what's driven uh, this uh, Gulf of Alaska winter survey, which you may have heard of, which first started two years ago. Um, in part, uh, the initiation of this was driven by Dick Beamish, retired uh, DFO scientist who, who privately raised a lot of the money to fund it on a Russian vessel. And now going forward, this is falling under the International Year of the Salmon and will be occurring um, basically, for, for hopefully, for every year going forward with a collaboration of vessels from multiple nations. So this is a great initiative, which is going to reveal a lot about what goes on with Pacific salmon at sea in their first winter, but probably not a lot about Chinook, um, and probably not a lot about Salish Sea Chinook, because most of these fish are still on the continental shelf and in near shore waters during their first marine winter. So our plan is a, a winter ecology study. So basically October to March, um, starting this winter and then extending into 2022, 23. Again, it's forming part of a larger pit tagging study looking at survival, which is led by PSF and BCCF. And we're operating on, on an on-call basis to take advantage of weather windows. So we've got some broad objectives. We wanna characterize winter habitat. So the bottom left shows systematic transects that we do uh, along different isobaths to ask questions about whether or not um, fish are, have an onshore or offshore distribution. And we're also doing systematic depth sampling to look at depth distribution uh, as we did in the Southern Gulf Islands. We are looking for evidence of winter starvation. So do fish actually experience nutritional stress in the winter? So we analyze the diets fresh. Uh, these are gastric lavage diets collected non-lethally again. So we're looking at the composition and quality of prey and also the fullness um, of the juvenile, uh, the juvenile salmon. And then we're looking at the condition and energy density of juvenile Chinook as well. And again, we're using scale analysis to reconstruct the growth of those fish over the previous summer. So we can then ask questions about whether or not the condition and energy density of these fish in late winter is related to their early growth. Did fish that, that didn't do well when they first enter in the ocean, are they subsequently starving to death? in their first winter at sea, which is the prediction of this, this critical size, critical period hypothesis. We're also parameterizing a bioenergetics model for these fish over winter. So basically we're, um, we're trying to understand uh, both whether those fish are experiencing starvation and also how they would respond to a decrease in food availability or to an increase in temperature under climate change. So being ectotherms, um, being cold-blooded, as temperature increases, the basal metabolic rate, um, just what's required to tick over is going to increase. And so assuming that food is limiting in the winter, uh, increasing temperatures could actually lead to winter starvation. So by putting together this bioenergetic model with the data that we're collecting during the winter, we're gonna actually be able to simulate uh, the responses uh, of overwintering juvenile Chinook to climate change. We're also working with Christy Miller's lab at PBS. We're taking gill biopsies, and these gill biopsies are going to be a uh, tiny little clip at the end of the gill filaments are going to be uh, run through, through the Miller lab's uh, cutting edge um, molecular approach, which basically looks at both the presence of microbes, whether those are viruses or, uh, or bacteria, and also the immune response of the fish. It can indicate whether a fish that is, uh, is still alive and still swimming is experiencing an immune response that is consistent with, uh, with being sick. And then finally, we're again contributing to this larger, um, larger pit tagging study. So basically the, the, the study that I described to you earlier in the Cowichan River is being ramped up to include not just Chinook, but also Coho, and also to include uh, virtually all the major producing systems on the east coast of Vancouver Island. So there's a major tagging project that's going to be going on over the next three years, both tagging fish in river and tagging fish in the marine environment to try to understand where bottlenecks to survival of these fish is occurring. 
So this is in action. I was out there two days ago. I'll be out there again two days from now. So I don't have any very final results. But we've spent 49 days out there this winter. Um, we've sampled about 294 first ocean winter Chinook, which is less than we'd hope, but is enough to, to conduct some meaningful analyses. Uh, we're seeing fork length of these fish plateau, which is consistent with nutritional limitation during the winter. And we're also seeing the condition of the fish decrease as the winter progresses. So this is a, basically a, a, a fit to residuals um, from a, a length weight regression. So basically it's a measure of fatness. Um, how fat are the fish by date? And up until late December, the, the condition is pretty constant. And then from late December to the end of February, it looks like there is a, a marked decline in the condition of these fish, suggesting this is potentially a period of nutritional stress. So uh, lots more to come here as we get the genetic stock identification for these fish and we actually know what stocks they're from so we can compare apples to apples. But uh, those meaningful analyses will have to wait for genetic stock identification. One of the big bonuses for me as kind of uh, someone who's interested in the, the critters is that this work's occurring in the northern strait of Georgia. So I've been able to set up a lab in my basement to analyze these stomach samples. Um, and that's my daughter. Uh, she doesn't do the IDs yet, but maybe she will in future. Uh, and I, since this is the Natural History Society, I thought you'd like some science-free photographs of things uh, as well. Um, so we, we get some really cool stuff. So this is an octopus paralarva. The thing that's so neat about this for folks who are used to looking at plankton samples or stomach contents that have been frozen or have been preserved in formalin is usually everything's ugly and rigid and uh, opaque, but we're getting these fascinating little animals that are still in many cases alive. Um, this is what I believe is a stubby squid, a rossia uh, paralarva. This, I think, is a larval silver spot sculpin. You can still see uh, the yolk sac there, but it's, it's close to absorbing its yolk sac. This is a nereid polychaete worm, and we actually see quite a lot of polychaete worms in these winter diets as the, uh, the, they're, they're swimming up off the bottom to engage in reproductive behavior in the water column. Uh, the gamerid, um, gamerid amphipod, Calliopeus, so this is another common stomach content. Uh, euphosids are also very important in the winter diets. So this is Thionessa longipes, uh, which is just a beautiful critter. And then this is one of the most, uh, the most important winter diet items, which is um, a hyperid amphipod primno. Uh, I think primno um, abyssalis. So they're absolutely fascinating. And they've got these amazing raptorial front appendages. You can infer from that that they're, they're quite a voracious predator, although this critter here is only about nine millimeters long. So I'm going to leave. Uh, I'm going to leave juvenile Chinook for now, and I'm going to move on uh, and take a bit of a jump to uh, our adult Chinook program. So hopefully, from from what I've talked about already, um, you can take away that food web structure is important. So for example, uh, herring are important, but it may not just be their abundance. It may also be their phenology, their reproductive timing, um, local density dependence, uh, you know, local abundance of specific age uh, age classes. So the food web structure is really important. And, and how do we keep track of, um, of changes in the food web? And I think we can assume that change is probably the new normal in the Salish Sea and, and further beyond. Um, you know, we're seeing warming. These are the BC lighthouse station anomalies from Peter Chandler's data set, 1930 to 2018. Uh, the Strait of Georgia is warming and we're seeing new species show up. So for example, these are pyrosomes on the bottom left, which are, um, have been showing up in the last, these pyrosome colonies have been showing up off the West Coast the last couple of years and, and a palm fret, some of these unusual fish that have also been showing up. So how do we monitor change through time in, in the ecosystem that's supporting, supporting the salmon resource out there? So one approach is predator diet sampling. Um, predator diet sampling can provide some insights in terms of spatial coverage and temporal coverage that are too expensive to gain by you know, traditional fishery independent sampling programs like, like the trawling that I discussed earlier. Uh, and in, in BC, we have uh, a year round public salmon fishery. So we have folks who are out there fishing for Chinook salmon in the winter and also fishing for Chinook salmon in the summer. So we had the idea that maybe we could actually partner uh, with fishers and uh, come up with a, a low cost program to monitor um, the status of pelagic food webs. And so this is what we set out to do. Um, and our short term objectives for this work were to address some basic knowledge gaps regarding Chinook and coho salmon diets in BC. 
So for example, there's never been data published on the winter diets uh, of these species in BC. Um, historical studies were typically tied to fishery openings in the commercial fishery. Uh, and also to get a good high resolution temporal picture and also just to update what we know because there haven't been any adult diet data published since the 1960s. Uh, we were hoping that the kind of data we would collect would provide an improved understanding of forage fish ecology. And then in the long term, we are, as I mentioned, we're hoping to use these salmon diets to actually monitor change in the ecosystem. And then I think there's a value in developing and maintaining a citizen science network by engaging, um, engaging recreational fishers and developing a two-way exchange of information. So our methods here are primarily to work with private anglers. So private anglers um, freeze the stomachs of the fish they catch along with a data card indicating where and when they caught it. And they drop them at depots at fishing tackle stores. We also supplement this by going out to cleaning stations and going to derbies from time to time. And engagement and retention is important. So if you submit 10 stomachs, you get a hat and we have a draw for prizes donated by Islander Reels and AP Tackle Works. Um, and we're also providing individual reports. So, so every uh, fisher who submits stomach will get an individualized report uh, of the diet of the fish that they submitted. And then in the lab, we're doing really comprehensive workup on, on the prey. We individually weigh and measure prey. Uh, and we also um, extract and measure otoliths. So these are the ear bones. A lot of prey are not measurable due to digestion, but by extracting the ear bones, we can measure them and we can relate the length uh, of the otolith to the length of the fish. And this allows us to reconstruct the size distribution of prey. And we're building collaborations with a lot of other researchers who are interested uh, in, in questions that relate to salmon diets. So for example, we, we've been providing samples to University of Washington for research on herring population genetics. We've been provi providing sand land samples to DFO and Environment Canada for work on how microplastics enter the food web. Um, we're providing some samples for DFO's work on how contaminants enter the food web supporting southern resident killer whales. Our diet data are being used by NOAA to parameterize their end-to-end -end ecosystem model of the Salish Sea. And then there's a number of groups such as Pachita First Nation, Rain Coast Education, Project Watershed, who have a specific local research interests um, that, that have a spatial scope to them. And so those groups are collaborating with us to collect stomachs and in some cases with funding. And then we're working with them um, to investigate those local, uh, local research questions. So just to give you a picture of the distribution of samples collected to date, um, we actually had a great year in 2020. I think people didn't travel a field and they stayed home and went fishing. Uh, and this shows the spatial distribution of Chinook salmon uh, stomach samples. So uh, as you can see, it's, it's centered on, on the Canadian waters of the Salish Sea with quite good coverage there. And a broad overview of diet composition. So this is just by season inside and outside the Salish Sea. And you can see diets overwhelmingly dominated by fish in red, and this is just Chinook salmon, with uh, the Salish Sea being particularly strongly dominated by fish. Now I'm going to break this down and show you what that red bar is composed of. So this is what, what components or what different fish species are being consumed by adult Chinook. So the light green is unsurprisingly herring. Herring are overwhelmingly the most important diet item, both inside and outside the Salish Sea in both summer and winter. Uh, there's some uh, diet items that show up inside the Salish Sea that are not important outside. So specifically anchovy, um, which is more important than winter than summer, uh, and also uh, gadids in dark green. So those are true cod, hake, um, hake pollock, and Pacific cod primarily. And then we're also gaining some, some very specific insights about the importance of herring. So this figure is showing a size frequency distribution of herring in stomachs within the Salish Sea by month. So from January at the top down to December at the bottom. And along the x-axis on the bottom is the standard length. And so what you can see is that small herring, um, so ones close to the left-hand side of the figure, uh, enter the diets in June. So herring spawn in March, right? And so here we have the, the age zero year class of herring recruiting into the diets in June. You can see those fish getting larger uh, through to about October, then staying roughly the same size through the winter, starting to get larger again in April. So, um, so these juvenile herring are important diets. But what's interesting is even though this is inside the Strait of Georgia, we also see 
that larger uh, adult herring are important in diets. And if you convert this figure, which is lengths into weights, um, what you see is through the summer months, so in the box there, that's May, June, July, August, that the diet is actually dominated by weight by these larger mature herring. So this is really interesting because the, the Strait of Georgia herring population, as, as you may know, is managed as a migratory stock. It's considered to primarily uh, leave the Strait of Georgia soon after spawning in April, feed on the west coast of Vancouver Island and not return until the following late fall and winter. And so what our data are showing is that herring that as adults stay within the Strait of Georgia are actually from the point of view of, of an important predator in the ecosystem, really, really important. So either the salmon are very good at finding these resident herring or else they're, they're perhaps a more important component of the Strait of Georgia ecosystem than is commonly considered. So we've got some great spin-offs coming out of this adult uh, diet work. Uh, and one of these is trying to understand what makes a uh, herring resident. And so using uh, some of the, the samples from the salmon diets themselves and now expanding that to, to samples collected elsewhere, Jessica Qualley, who's doing her master's in our lab, is trying to understand whether, whether the, uh, the decision of a herring to stay within the Strait of Georgia or migrate to the outer coast is perhaps driven by its growth rate early in life. So that's a, a super exciting project that has grown out of this and is ongoing. So now just another sort of broad picture. Um, what do we see in terms of the fullness of Chinook salmon, which could give us some kind of indication of, of how available um, mid trophic level forage fish prey is in the ecosystem. So this is a model fit, but you don't really have to worry about that. The takeaway is that uh, the different regions which are color coded in the, in the top right. So here we have the Strait of Georgia in dark green, Howe Sound in orange, Gulf Islands, Harrow Strait in red and the Strait of Juan de Fuca in a lighter uh, greeny blue, um, we see consistently uh, fuller stomachs in the Strait of Georgia uh, across at least the last three years. And, and probably that's because we have a better sample size in those three years. So the Strait of Georgia appears to be an area of high stomach fullness. In at least two years, the Strait of Juan de Fuca appears to be an area of low stomach fullness, which is interesting. And this is now an, a, a similar figure, but showing the frequency of empty stomachs. So now uh, being higher uh, on the graph is bad because instead of being fuller, it means you've got more empty stomachs. So we see this pattern where the frequency of empty stomachs is again also highest in Juan de Fuca Strait. So this is kind of interesting, you know, as people are trying to understand why, um, why southern resident killer whales are doing poorly and uh, Juan de Fuca Strait is, is very much within their core um, their core habitat. So one of the questions is, could, could Juan de Fuca Strait actually be a region where right from the bottom up, the, um, the food web is a bit uh, impoverished? So early days, but, but just an insight into the kind of things that we're hoping to do with this. And then we're also uh, hoping to be able to use this program to look at interannual trends and to try to understand how forage fish communities are changing through time. So this is just a broad picture to date. And again, this is fullness and the, co the components of fullness. So what this figure is telling you is that basically fullness has stayed relatively constant across the four years that we've been doing this program. We're seeing possibly uh, a slight increase in the importance of herring, uh, likely a decrease in the importance of anchovy in light orange. So it's still early days, but I show you this more um, just to say that I, I do believe this program has the potential to tell us if the bottom really drops out of the food web and also to tell us if something important disappears or if something important appears. So some next steps with this adult salmon diet work, we're gonna make our database publicly available through the Strait of Georgia Data Center so other researchers can work with these data. We wanna to continue to develop our relationships with fishers and community groups and First Nations to try to make our sampling as representative as possible. And then we're always looking for other groups who are interested to collaborate um, and, and identify what samples or data we could collect for them. And then I'm hoping this can become an indefinite program. So we're, we're planning for program sustainability. And to date, we, we really appreciate the Pacific Salmon Foundation's support of this work because they've, they've been, uh, been very helpful in addition to some support from DFO, World Wildlife Fund Canada uh, and Project Watershed. So I guess some overall conclusions uh, from this talk. Um, fish don't all do the same thing and fine scale processes matter. And I think more work is necessary to really dig into that. 
Uh, and I think folks that are designing larger scale surveys and trawl surveys should take into account that uh, the things may be going on at finer scale than those surveys can actually resolve. Uh, herring are very important. So uh, I think that stands out uh, as being a key conclusion uh, and not just the abundance of herring, but also um, specific things about their distribution and their reproductive phenology may also be very important. And then I think uh, salmon and ocean ecology need not be the exclusive pre preserve of state agencies. And, and I think DFO and NOAA and other state agencies have done remarkable work um, on, on the coast of the Pacific Northwest, um, moving forward the science of salmon ocean ecology. And there's some terrific people doing that work. Uh, but I think it's healthy if, uh, if there's methods out there where smaller groups, smaller stakeholders, um, including First Nations and others can become participants and actually be, be active players in that work. I think that's really useful. Um, and I think we're gonna see that happening. So I think with that, uh, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Will. Uh, so uh, people can either put a question on chat or unmute yourself and uh, ask it live. Maybe I could start it off, Will. Um, uh, just wondering, how long do the Chinook stay in Georgia Strait before they leave or, or do they? <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. There's been uh, there's been a shift in thinking a little bit. Uh, some of the traditional workers on this, like Michael Healy, who did most of his work in the 1980s, 1970s and 1980s, he was of the opinion that about 30% of Georgia Strait Chinook spent their entire lives uh, within the Strait. Um, more recent work based on trawl surveys conducted by DFO suggested that that really virtually none did, uh, and they almost all left, typically uh, after their first ocean summer, and uh, work in Puget Sound, um, contemporary work in Puget Sound, suggests something more similar to, to Healy's assertion that you have about a third of the fish perhaps being totally resident. Um, and also some, some overlap. You have fish that are partial migrants that, that may uh, live within Puget Sound, move out to the coast for a short period of their life, come back for part of their life. So I think it's a question that, that we don't have a firm answer to. Uh, certainly, I can tell you that there are, um, there are fish in their first ocean winter in the Strait of Georgia right now. I can tell you that there's fish in their second ocean winter in the Strait of Georgia right now. Um, and I can tell you from the distribution of marine catches of coated wire tags that some stocks quite clearly virtually all leave because they're very rarely caught as adults in the Strait of Georgia and other stocks have a greater tendency to be caught as adults in the Strait of Georgia. But I think this, um, this winter ecology study that we're doing with, uh, with BC Conservation Foundation and Pacific Salmon Foundation is gonna collect a lot of data that is gonna help answer that. And we also have a fellow in our lab, uh, Micah Quindazi, who's, who's doing a PhD um, looking at the chemical composition of otoliths, so the ear bones again. And by looking at, at the chemical makeup of, of otoliths, he's hoping to be able to separate residents and migrants in the returns of adults. Yeah. And so that will hopefully provide some insights as well into just, just the relative importance of those groups. Right, thanks. Um, a couple, some questions on chat. Uh, will this be recorded? Uh, yes, it's, it'll be on our YouTube site, on the Victoria Natural History's YouTube site. And do you expect to see your Sansom Narrows fish to be a different genetic, genetic stock than your Maple Bay fish? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. The, um, no, uh, I did initially perhaps think that there'd be a lot of structure in, in um, that, that all of those differences, right? The, the differences in growth, the differences in size, the differences in diet, 
could potentially be explained by differences in stock composition between the two sites. Perhaps uh, fish from the Cowichan River were, were hanging out in one site and, and the other site we were catching fish that were transiting through from different stocks. But the figures that I showed were, were um, primarily, I think most of the figures I showed were for, for an ocean type stock group. So it was more than one stock. But the same patterns hold if you limit the analysis just to Cowich and Chinook. So um, even though you've got these sites that are that are very close proximity to each other, um, even when you consider only Chinook of a single genetic stock, you still see that structure. Okay. Uh, another question: uh, Is there a high incidence of empty stomachs in? J.D. Juan de Fuca, and may that be a cause of their migration to the Georgia Strait? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So there, there is lower stomach in the adults. So, so it's an interesting question because um, it applies both to juveniles and adults. So uh, Skip McKinnell, um, is a retired DFO scientist has proposed what he calls the trophic gauntlet hypothesis, which is the idea that discovery passage to the north and the Strait of Juan de Fuca to the south, due to their very strong tidal mixing, are areas of lower um, productivity because phytoplankton blooms can't really take off because phytoplankton are constantly being mixed down into deep water where they don't have light access. So he's proposed that, that passing through those gauntlets could be a really important period for juvenile salmon, because if they don't achieve adequate reserves prior to, to passing through the gauntlet, they're really on sort of starvation mode as they pass through those areas. And so uh, there's some possibility that, that the duration of residence of different stocks and different species of Pacific salmon within the Strait of Georgia may in part be related to uh, when it makes sense to run the gauntlet. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that question bore more on adult salmon because um, those were the data I presented for Juan de Fuca. So yes, we see lower stomach fullness and more empty stomachs in Juan de Fuca. Uh, the fish are entering the Strait of Georgia um, primarily to spawn. So, so, you know, they're not avoiding the, the poor feeding of, of Juan de Fuca. They're passing through on their way back to spawn. Um, but what's interesting is, is we thought, obviously, fish, as they approach spawning, uh, they feed less. So one possibility is that we saw more empty stomachs and lower stomach fullness in the Strait of Juan de Fuca with the adult Chinook because it's a migratory passageway for mature fish. And so we're catching more mature fish that are therefore not feeding. So it's got nothing to do with the Juan de Fuca and more to do with the fish we're catching there. Yeah. But what's interesting is we see the same pattern in winter. So in winter, those fish are not undergoing their spawning migration. So it suggests that something really may be going on that makes Juan de Fuca a poorer feeding habitat. Mm -hmm. um, oh, he goes on to, to ask, uh, the graph showing herring size seemed to show that the largest fish had empty stomachs. That yeah. seems odd. Yeah, so I wrote a, I've, I've, I've spilled some ink over that. Um, the, uh, that's, in, it is, it is interesting. So not only did, did, um, not only were the fish with empty stomachs typically larger, and this is talking about the juvenile work now, it gets a bit confusing, so we're going back and forth, but this is talking about the juveniles, but they were also faster growing. And what I think is going on is that the fish with empty stomachs were disproportionately those which had switched to piscivory so, and switched to feeding on age zero herring. So actually fish with empty stomachs were herring feeders. And there's a couple of possibilities for that. One is that some fish regurgitate <clears throat> on capture. And it's possible that if all you have in your stomach is a herring, it's more it's easier to completely regurgitate and end up with an empty stomach than if you have a bunch of little tiny crab larvae, you're always gonna have a few left. Yeah. Uh, so it may be that some of the fish with empty stomachs in that study were in fact fish which had regurgitated a herring. Another possibility is I showed the figure where um, 
I showed the figure where herring occurred very much less often with other prey types. So given that these fish were so close to a size threshold to eat juvenile herring, it's possible they could only fit, you know, one herring in their stomach. So while they're searching for that herring, they're not going to go and fill their stomach half full of crab larvae because when they find that herring, they're not going to have any room for it. <laughs> so if you go to the literature, you find that in piscivorous fish, empty stomachs are more frequent. So, mm -hmm. so this is a pattern. You, you do tend to find um, in fish eating fish that the occurrence of empty stomachs is higher. So this raises the question, and, and I mean, it comes back to the adult stuff too. Quite often, empty stomachs are used as a proxy for poor feeding. But these results sort of raise the question, are we safe to do that? Are we safe to assume that empty stomachs are a proxy for poor feeding? They could be a proxy for, for fish which have successfully transitioned to piscivory. It's a really interesting question. So it's a kind of an all or nothing there. Either full or looking for something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess that same person uh, said, or was my previous questions graph Chinook or Herring? <laughs> Do the salmon take advantage of tides to migrate? So the, this, both the salmon, I, I didn't have time to show it, but both the salmon in the, in the, the San Sonaro's Maple Bay case study, the, the Maple Bay tagged fish appeared to not really have a tidal pattern to their distribution. The Sansom Narrows tagged fish did have a strong tidal pattern to their distribution in that area. And that pattern matched the pattern of the herring schools from the sonar analysis. Mm -hmm. So, so I didn't have time to go into that, but we did detect evidence that there was a, a tidal coordination between the larger, more piscivorous, faster growing juvenile Chinook and the juvenile herring. Okay. Um, any more questions? I don't see any more on the chat. Um, somebody says, thank you, Will, for taking the time to present your findings. And I think that's all. So, um, oh, here's some. Are they, oh. So are they swimming with or against the tide? basically with it to to be downstream of of the constriction of the narrows in the more turbulent area okay thanks very interesting much appreciated well done thanks enjoyed the talk will well thank you oh, very much everyone yeah. for coming i appreciate yeah, it well it was very good very well presented and, uh, lots of graphs but you explained them well and uh, what the take home message is, I think that's important. <laughs> so I think with that, we will uh, say thank you, Will, and uh, sign off. Is this more thank yous coming in? Well, thank you, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs> okay. So there's a few people left there. Uh, don't see any more questions. So uh, thank you very much, Will. I'll, I'll sign off and end the meeting. Stop the recording. <laughs>